everyone. Uh, my name's Deborah Rosenfeld and I'm the uh, Head of Library Sector Engagement here at the State Library. This evening's uh, seminar is being held on the homelands of the Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation. And I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners and to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, along with the elders of other communities who may be here tonight. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to the Policy Pitch, a joint initiative of State Library Victoria and Grattan Institute. Uh, a great crowd tonight might have something to do with the theme. I'd especially like to give a warm welcome to tonight's speakers, John Daly, Stephen Duckett, Tony Wood and Marion Terrell. Welcome also to uh, Friends of the State Library and uh, Grattan Institute members, uh, ladies and gentlemen, everyone in fact. So I hear that Grattan turned 10 this year. I'd like to wish our program partners a very happy birthday. I'm not going to sing. Um, and congratulate CEO John Daly and the whole team on many achievements over the decade. Public policy changes people's lives. Which is why the work of the Grattan Institute in interrogating policy to get the best outcomes is so important. Now, as a public librarian of more than 20 years standing and as the State Library's Head of Library Sector Engagement, I'm afraid I cannot resist the opportunity to say a little bit about not the Grattan Institute, but public libraries and how they change lives too. So you bear with me. Victorian public libraries receive over 30 million visitors annually, equivalent to five visits per Victorian, and visitation continues to outpace population growth. Please put your hand up if you visit a public library. Most of you, thank you. Uh, Victoria's public libraries are financial multipliers, if that sort of thing matters to you overly, generating $4.30 in benefit for every dollar invested. Witchcraft. <laughs> <laughs> they are places that build healthy and productive communities by supporting all kinds of literacy at all stages of life. About 40% of our public libraries provide adult literacy activities or English language programs. Libraries are the primary providers of early years literacy programs for children aged 0 to 3 and their families. And all the research tells us that that 0 to 3 is the most critical age range for developing literacy skills. Public libraries is where it will happen. Public libraries also support digital literacy through the provision of training and free access to computers and the internet. Libraries, public libraries especially, are one of the few remaining places we can go for services and not pay a cent. They are safe and open places for everyone. A meeting point for memory, discovery, culture and ideas. And importantly, our public libraries support many government agendas, including education, literacy, social inclusion, community building, community well-being, mental health, and many others. And like the Grattan Institute, they encourage the contest of ideas. So, I am delighted that State Library Victoria's partnership with the Grattan Institute continues to deliver important conversations like the one we're having tonight. Australia, us, we're going to the polls on Saturday the 18th of May. And uh, while the pros and cons of electric cars was an interesting early debate, uh, we're sure there's much to come. This evening's Grat Grattan Institute's tax energy, health, housing, retirement incomes and transport and cities experts will consider the major issues in their fields and nominate the choices they believe will make a difference to Australia's future. We'll all be voting armed with a greater understanding of important policy priorities for the next government.
Leading tonight's discussion is CEO of the Grattan Institute, John Daly, immediately on my right. John has published extensively on economic reform priorities, budget policy, tax reform, housing affordability, generational inequality, a matter close to my heart. He's worked at the University of Oxford, the Victorian Department of Premier and Cabinet, consulting firm McKinsey & Co and ANZ Bank in fields including law, public policy, strategy and finance. Please welcome me, welcome, not welcome me, well welcome me, <laughs> welcome me and join me in welcoming uh, John Daly, Stephen, Tony and Marion from the Grattan Institute. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction from uh, the library and we continue to um, really appreciate the support that this partnership uh, is providing uh, in terms of promoting public debate and as you point out it's exactly what libraries are for. So thank you everyone for coming uh, and thank you uh, in particular to starting on my right immediately Tony Wood the program director for Grattan's energy program, Marion Terrell who directs our cities and transport program or more accurately transport and cities but um, Marion is very happy to talk about both in either order, uh, and Stephen Duckett, uh, who uh, is the program director for our health program. Uh, it's great to have you all here. I have to bring the apologies of Danielle Wood, who runs our budget uh, uh, reform and uh, uh, institutional reform program. Uh, unfortunately, she acquired a very nasty bacterium in the budget lockup, uh, and has, acquired, has election acquired complications. Uh, and so can't be with us tonight and I'm going to do her level best to channel her, although she's told me that I'm not allowed to say that we should lock up lobbyists who breach the code of conduct, so there will be a small prize towards the end for someone who can think of a much more unpleasant pop, uh, punishment for them. Um, and I'm sure with the creativity of this crowd that won't be hard. So. Uh, tonight we are talking about the next election. Uh, for those of you who've had a chance to see it, we published uh, late last night our Commonwealth Orange Book 2019, which is uh, Grattan's guide to what we think should be the priorities uh, for the next Commonwealth Government. Some of these things indeed are the priorities of one party or another, very occasionally both, more usually neither. Uh, but we're also very confident that come 19th of May, whoever gets elected will start talking about at least some things that they were not talking about on the 18th of May. That has been the pattern for uh, many, many years and hopefully this will give them a guide to, uh, amongst other things, talking about some of the things that they should be talking about but are not yet on the agenda. Um, we call it an orange book uh, because uh, whilst we're in this caretaker period, whilst the election campaign is running, uh, public servants uh, pr uh, prepare a blue book and a red book as incoming briefs for whoever happens to be the next government. Uh, Marion tells me that in fact once upon a time the blue book was for whoever was in government if they got returned uh, and the red book was for whoever was not in government if they happened to win. And now of course this time around that also correlates to the um, colours of the parties. Uh, there is some suspicion that in fact those books are now simply kept with the colours of the parties to, um, major parties to avoid uh, confusion. But whichever way it goes, one is prepared for the government, one is prepared for the opposition, and, and whichever party gets elected, the other one is literally pulped, or indeed these days not literally pulped, because at the Commonwealth level, I am reliably informed they are in fact handed over to the Prime Minister and ministers uh, on large iPads. So presumably it's simply the iPad that gets wiped. So that's why we call ours the Orange Book after Grattan's um, uh, one true policy focus which is on the colour orange and its derivatives. Um, uh, you can always pick a Grattan chart as someone said to me a little while back. And I think that this has been a particularly interesting Orange Book partly because it's a, been a chance to look back over 10 years worth of Grattan work and that's quite a lot of work and, and essentially try and put it together in a coherent package that says well here's a program for the next government. It doesn't cover everything that's at stake in this election. In fact, it's quite short on electric cars. But um, it does cover a very large number of the issues that the Commonwealth Government is responsible for, about 80% of Commonwealth spending. Um, we've talked about some of the things that are there. It doesn't cover defence, national security issues, doesn't really cover migration, 
uh, properly, it doesn't cover early childhood, it doesn't cover social services, a number of things that Grattan, frankly, hasn't done work on, and therefore we don't feel qualified to talk about them. But there's a lot of territory it does cover. One of the other things that's a little bit different about this orange book is that we've tried to create a scorecard of how Australia is doing. So we picked uh, nine countries other than Australia that look very like Australia. Uh, we have one very enthusiastic member of staff, Matt Cowgill, who was uh, on a slow Melbourne Cup day, uh, decided that or, uh, he was going to build a little app that, that allowed you to decide what it was that you thought made a country most like Australia, and you can play with those different things. If you're really excited, you can go and play for yourself on the blog. Uh, and I can assure you that you will wind up with almost always more or less the same group of nine or ten countries. It's, it's actually remarkable how stable it is, unless you decide you really don't care about how small the population is, in which case you will discover that uh, Luxembourg and Iceland look quite like Australia, apart from the fact that they have about 1% of the population. Um, so uh, what this scorecard does is then look across a huge range of areas that we do cover, economic development, energy, cities, transport, health, regional development and so on, and ask, if we take the two or three key metrics um, that, that explain how we're doing, where are we? And how do we compare with the countries that we like to compare ourselves to? So, frankly, Mexico does not make the cut. Um, if we're doing a lot better than Mexico on health, the right answer is, well, I would hope, hope so. Uh, the real question is whether we're doing better or worse or about the same, and more to the point, whether we can learn from the Canadas, the Japans, the South Koreas, the Netherlands, the Germanys of this world, the countries that, frankly, I think most Australians think that are our peers. So, that's what we're trying to do. And then the question is, what comes out of that picture? So uh, if we look at economic development, for example, we discover that in terms of income per capita, we're doing kind of OK, but nothing very special. We're, if you like, in the bottom third of that group of 10. Uh, and when you look at the history, essentially what happened was that we did really well relative to everyone else through the financial crisis, whereas most of our peers essentially went backwards and then went flat. We had this period of really very strong uh, economic growth uh, through or income growth through uh, 2009 all the way through to about 2012. And then since then, frankly, not much has happened. Uh, but economic growth in other countries has really picked up and they've essentially taken away from us. So that's the kind of the overall economic and income story, but that's not the only thing that matters. Tony, how are we doing on energy? Um, I think the answer is not so good. Um, in fact, exactly the opposite, because our energy, our electricity in particular, is more polluting, less reliable, and higher in emissions than any of the other, these countries across this in a comparable basis. Now, when you look at them in a bit more detail, we're not as expensive as Germany, and we're not as unreliable as New Zealand. But all the other ones, we, uh, we kick it out of the park, and on the emission side, we are so far in front of everybody else that the other two don't almost matter. Um, and so we've got some really cha interesting challenges. The one where we aren't so bad, despite a lot of concerns that people in this country have is on gas, where our gas prices are actually about the middle of the pack. The reason it seems a lot worse than that is because our gas prices have gone up a lot because they used to be very cheap. Um, they're now a bit more, ex more expensive than the US and Canada, but pretty well line up with just about all the other countries that John's been talking about. So we've done a pretty good job of making sure that we achieved the electricity system was pretty unreliable, low emissions, and we didn't even get it cheap. <coughs> we've got some ways to go. So, Marion, we didn't have metrics for transport. Why not, and, and what does it say? So, transport is pretty prominent in elections, but we don't have a metric because it's quite hard to make comparisons between countries on a metric that would make sense in this context. So, what we will expect to see, I think, as the campaign unfolds, is that the, the major parties will promise all sorts of big infrastructure projects. And... And that will be, in, that's the form that their promises take. And looking back to what happened at the last federal election, what we saw there was that they promised all sorts of things and typically without doing their due diligence. So that we now have a structural solution for this. We have Infrastructure Australia's been going close to 10 years now and everyone is supposed to put their projects through Infrastructure Australia to assess whether they're national priorities, whether they're worth funding. But in the last election, in 2016, what we found was uh, the coalition um, only had 15% of its promised money 
was in the category of endorsed by Infrastructure Australia and a high priority, 3% uh, for the Coalition and zero for the Greens. So I think that'll be the thing to watch um, in, a, in the sense of, of comparison, that looking at this comparison over time, I think we can hope to see a bit of a better result this time, but we'll see. And we'll, we will publish something on this a bit closer to the election when those promises unfold. So on housing and schooling, we're not doing particularly well either, but um, we might jump over those and talk about health. Stephen. So in contrast, health is a good news story. Uh, so if you look at uh, a measure of cost and a measure of uh, outcomes, uh, on cost, uh, whichever way you measure it, uh, health expenditure per head of population or a share of GDP, we're in the right quadrant. Uh, lower than the average of our, of our peers uh, in terms of, uh, of those measures. In terms of outcomes, uh, we used life expectancy, but as it turns out, it doesn't matter if you use other measures either, like health-adjusted life expectancy or avoidable mortality. We're in the right... Uh, we're above the, the average of our peers, so better life expectancy, lower costs is, is a good sign. The third measure we used, though, was not so good. Uh, we looked at uh, p consumer out-of-pocket costs, and uh, Australia is on the very high side of that. I think only South Korea, of our comparable countries, uh, is higher than us. Than, than us. Um, and so we are a, a very poor performer. We, we rely more on out-of-pocket costs than other comparable countries. Thank you. And if you look at a couple of the others, one, one interesting one, uh, given that I suspect retirement incomes is something we are going to hear a little bit more about uh, in this campaign. We've started to be a debate about superannuation in the last day or two. Um, uh, is uh, Australia has some quite distinctive patterns. In terms of how well do people live in retirement if they're on relatively low incomes, the answer is, you know, it's not too bad. So what we call replacement rates, what are your resources in retirement relative to your resources before retirement, if you're on a relatively low income, the answer is actually that doesn't look too bad compared to much of the rest of the OECD, and I suspect that's because we have a quite unusually designed age pension that you essentially qualify for irrespective of whether or not you've ever worked, uh, and if you, are, if you have no other resources, is by OECD standards quite generous, particularly for people who have never um, worked or have maybe worked uh, intermittently through their lives. Uh, but on the other hand, we have a system in which government's liability today for pensions and indeed in the future is relatively very low. Uh, and that's because on the other side of the age pension, we don't pay you any more than the, the basic rate. Uh, and whereas a lot of other OECD countries pay you more if you have contributed more over your life and consequently they have quite large pension liabilities already and they will get much larger uh, over the next uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, and uh, the, maybe the last one to focus on is, is around uh, the integrity of our institutions. Because I think our self-image of ourselves as a country is that we have pretty clean institutions. That, that corruption is not a problem in Australia. Uh, that government is well run. And I think one of the things that comes through as we start to compare ourselves is, you know, we're not actually doing as well as we might think relative to these peer countries. We are typically at the bottom or pretty close. Uh, and we've got worse, materially worse, in terms of falling down the rankings over the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, and when you look at where we are in terms of our institutions, in terms of the way that we do, or more to the point, don't, at a Commonwealth level, uh, control maximum spending on campaigns, uh, donations disclosure, um, uh, who is lobbying whom, what you're allowed to do after you leave, leave politics so that you don't get the situation of a minister moving straight into the re uh, industry that they were regulating. Uh, on all of these things, uh, the Commonwealth Government is doing uh, worse than a number of other countries overseas and, interestingly, much worse than the States. Uh, indeed, literally today, uh, a decision has been handed down by the High Court that says that uh, the... Um, restrictions that Queensland has put on political donations will in fact apply effectively uh, to people in Queensland through the Commonwealth election campaign. 
uh, which is frankly going to create a constitutional mess that a lot of constitutional lawyers are going to have a lot of fun with. Uh, and as an ex-constitutional lawyer, I agree, you know, I approve of that state of affairs. But uh, it does illustrate the way that uh, the states, many of the states, have got a long way ahead of the Commonwealth uh, in this area. So if we look at that overall scorecard, with the exception of that, you know, very obviously bright spot in health, it would be fair to say it's... Um, uh, if your child came home from school with that, it's a mixed report card, there's a kind of A for health, but there's a lot of C's and D's and one or two E's, energy for E for energy. Uh, and you would be saying, uh, John, I'm really sorry and very, very disappointed with you, uh, and uh, I think you ought to be focusing a little bit harder over the next year or so. And one of my favourite charts in the report is one that looks at the major reforms in Australia over the last... 40-odd uh, years, uh, so going back to the beginning of the Hawke-Keating reforms. And when you kind of plot those major reforms against, you know, over time and relative to the governments that made them, it really is very true and very obvious that there were a lot of very, very substantial reforms that went through uh, under Hawke-Keating uh, and that are now very much part of the furniture. It's also quite obviously true that there were a lot of things that went through under the Howard government that have stuck. Uh, and that are also very much seen as part of the furniture. But it's then pretty clear that under the Rudd, Gillard, Rudd, Abbott, Mor uh, uh, <laughs> Turnbull, Morrison <laughs> government, uh, governments, um, firstly, there is substantially less in the way of major reform, and secondly, there's a lot of reform that's been rolled back. Uh, so carbon pricing being the most obvious example, uh, but, for example, the Abbott government's initial proposal to move um, the age at which you can qualify for the age pension up to 70 and then walking back from that, which would have been a very substantial reform, uh, is, is one of a number of things that have happened or have been proposed and committed to by governments, but then they have essentially walked back. Uh, and that's made a relatively thin set of reforms look even thinner. But it struck me as I was thinking about this, Stephen, um, if, health is the if health is the kind of bright spot, the A on our report card, is there something differently that we've done about health reform in Australia over the last 15 years? Or was there something that we did differently 20 years ago that's managed to carry through and maintain our position in terms of delivering very good health outcomes for relatively moderate costs? So I think there's been a, a remarkable stability in health policy over from about 19, the 1980s onwards. So uh, with the uh, Medibank was introduced in the mid 70s, then slowly demolished over the 70s and early 80s. Uh, and then come the election of the Hawke government, uh, as part of the accord, Medicare came in and the health minister, Neil Blewett, saw it as his job to keep Medicare stable that was stable right through the 80s into the 90s. And John Howard, as leader of the opposition, said, we're not going to destroy Medicare if we get elected. And then they kept that promise right through the 90s. And so by and large, there's been an enormous stability. Uh, so major reform in the early 80s as part of the Hawke-Keating Hawke years. And then and that has been solidified and kept. And that has meant that there's been reasonable access both to primary care and hospital services, public hospital services, which has provided a really important infrastructure uh, that Australians value. And uh, so I think that's been a major, a major important factor. Whether that's a factor that distinguishes us from everybody else, it certainly distinguishes us from the United States, which has got the worst health system of the advanced economies um, in terms of life expectancy or cost, but, uh, but it has been one of the outstanding features. Mm. Uh, one of the other things that struck me as we were looking at that, that shift in history was the way that we're seeing a lot more government intervention, and I guess, Tony, no more, no, nowhere more than energy. You know, I thought governments had kind of got out of the generation business. Well, you have to go back a long time in memory to when we had stability in energy and climate change policy. Um, and for a while we did. Um, in fact, Victoria was at the centre of some of the reforms that were initiated by um, the Keating government in particular and then um, followed through by uh, John Howard. 
but we lost our way very badly because the idea was that we would have well-regulated markets, we'd have competition where we could, we'd have regulation where we couldn't, and for the first 10 years of the introduction of, that mechani of those mechanisms, it worked pretty well. Prices were low, they were stable, and life was going on. But unfortunately, two things happened. One is a number of external factors outside of government's control started to play through. So uh, the whole issue of climate change started to really bite seriously in, 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 in a number of countries who did it somewhat differently from the way we've not done it. Um, in addition to that, we've seen that the cost of gas have an impact. Even the cost of coal has an impact. And then the ageing, the, the retirement of very old qualified power stations. Now, what happened when things start to go the way governments don't think the markets were going to work, sometimes they respond the right way, which is to fix the market, which is the way you deal with all your toys and mechanical things at home. The other one is to say, this is broken, I don't want it anymore. And unfortunately, in energy, we've slipped into that way of the world when governments have said, well, we're going to have to fix this because prices are too high or emissions are too high, whatever it might be, or reliability is too low. And we've seen a number of interventions. Unfortunately, in Australia, the prices have just kept going up, despite some of most of those interventions. And, um, you know, this is not having a particular dig at anybody in, in particular, but when Angus Taylor was given the job of Minister for Lower Prices, every single month since he took over the job, the prices have gone up. So it's not a great record in terms of the way we've done this. And the best example, I think, that I can think of is the combination of Queensland government, the way they've played with their own government-owned generators and, and really screwed over the Queensland consumer. And potentially, in the case of the Commonwealth, when um, they bought out the other two shareholders, Victoria and uh, New South Wales, in Snowy Hydro to, and, as a major investment, created a government-owned corporation, which was going to compete with the private sector, including in retail, and then announced they were going to do the battery of the, of the, 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 um, the nation-building project called Snowy Hydro 2.0. Now, what's scary about this, and this is something that Marion and her field looks at very closely, is a project which started at 2.5 billion is now 4.5 billion is now 5.1 billion, without even connecting it to anything, is going the wrong way. And this is, um, when people say this is a commercial organisation making commercial decisions, it's not. It's one shareholder. It will do what it's one shareholder wants. Well, and I think we can see that pattern kind of emerging in a number of areas. We've obviously the, the Rudd government um, uh, announcement around the National Broadband Network, which I guess had the same sort of let's work out a number literally on a napkin, I think, in that case and announce it and then we'll kind of think about whether the cost-benefit case adds up. Um, Stephen, we've had substantial in, um, intervention in the private health insurance market already in terms of freezing the premiums. Um. Well, the, the, there's the promise to freeze the premiums if Labor gets elected. Um, private health insurance has been uh, an outstanding policy failure in, in health. Um, what's happened over the last 20 years is uh, in 1996-7, the then, uh, I think, uh, Michael Woodridge as health minister uh, introduced the first subsidy to private health insurance uh, in recent times and it costs uh, $600 million um, in dollar terms, in, in not in real terms, but in actual dollar terms, it's now about $6 billion. Um, obviously, price uh, when you take CPI and population, there's a much lower growth, but a lot of money is now spent on the private health insurance rebate, and there's a lot of complaints. Uh, about 45% of the population has uh, private health insurance, uh, and there are two factors which are driving that industry uh, in a vicious cycle. The first is young people are either dropping out or not joining, and old people are staying in private health insurance, and so the risk pool is getting worse and worse and worse, and so the average um, 35 to 45 year old is now drawing proportionally much less out of the fund and the average older person is drawing much more and so it is so from a from a pure business proposition for a 35 to 45 year old health insurance is much less um, uh, of a good a good investment and the second thing that's happened is that over the same sort of period in in the mid 90s if you took out health insurance you basically had top cover 65 percent I think of the people who had health insurance had a product with no deductibles, no upfront payments if you went to hospital and everything was covered. 
today only 16 or so percent have a top cover. So we've shifted from 65% with top cover to 16% or so with top cover, which is a massive transfer of risk away from the health insurance funds to the consumers. There's been no increase in health literacy, so the consumers don't know what's happening, so they're disappointed when they discover an out of big out-of-pockets, which is then causing people to be more and more dissatisfied. So private health insurance policy is a mess. It's got to be addressed somehow uh, in the next term of government. Uh, Labor has pol promised a review by the Productivity Commission. We think the Liberals should say, look, we can't just keep propping it up and patching it up with gold, silver, bronze and so on. We've got to actually step back and say, what's its role? What are we going to do? And where can it, how is it going to go forward? So, Stephen, uh, we've kind of leapt into um, uh, one material health reform. Uh, one of the things that we did as part of the Orange Book was take the big step back once we'd kind of got to the end of it. We'd all written out our very long wish lists of all the things we would love the Commonwealth Government to do, and we forced ourselves to ask, so out of all of this, what would you prioritise? The reality is no government can do everything. Uh, no matter how talented your Prime Minister and Minister's uh, resources are limited, the most scarce resource of all being, if you like, prime ministerial and ministerial time. The time and political capital to go and argue for difficult reforms and make them happen. If you try and make eight reforms happen at once, I can guarantee you that only one of them will happen and it'll be the one that, in fact, doesn't matter very much. Uh, and so how do you um, take out of all of this what's big and what's relatively little? So we went through that exercise. You can see the prioritisation that's that's in the Orange Report. I think it's actually one of the substantial contributions that it makes. And we essentially prioritised on two dimensions, a little bit familiar to those of you who've seen our Game Changers report. One, is it big? Does it affect a lot of people in a major way? Um, whether that's about the economic difference it makes to their lives or the services it provides um, or its impact on the budget or whatever. And then we asked, is it doable? Is it something that the Commonwealth is responsible for as opposed to the states? Uh, is it something where there's a reasonable consensus amongst policymakers? Is it something where um, the public is not inherently or innately uh, averse to it? Um, because um, you know, one of the things is we have reforms where the first order impacts are really obvious and horrible, and the second order impacts are less obvious but very positive. Publics don't tend to like those things very much unless you spend a lot of time explaining to them what the second order impacts are. So um, applying that sort of, you know, how big is it and how doable is it? Stephen, is, is private health insurance and, and out-of-pocket costs, are they at the top of your list? Well, uh, the, 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 the critical issue with private health insurance and out-of-pocket costs for that matter, and in fact reform of primary care payments, is that they, we don't precisely know what to do tomorrow. We can't go forward and say, this is the answer, and there's no consensus that this is the answer, and there are significant interest groups who say, we don't think that's the answer. So in those cases, there needs to be a process of rigorous investigation, building consensus, and so on, and it's not worth the minister's time going tomorrow and saying, we're going to do all this, because who knows what we should be doing. However, there are some areas where we know we need to be doing something, and one of those is dental care. For some peculiar reason, historic, the mouth is not seen as part of the body. Op and very interestingly, the eye is. Optometry is covered by Medicare, but dental care is not. And so what happens is, as a result of that, two million Australians miss out on dental care because of cost. 58% uh, or so of dental costs are met out of pocket, whereas for pharmaceuticals or doctors, it's down in the... It, below 10%, for example. So we've argued that you need to do something about dental. That's a biggie, and we ought to be thinking about it. Staged over 10 years, but you won't get to universal coverage unless you start somewhere. We think you should start somewhere uh, with pensioners and healthcare card holders. Is it a bigger deal than cancer? <laughs> um, I'm not entirely sure whether cancer was done on the back of a napkin, but what I, what I would say is that the out-of-pocket costs, more people are missing out on care uh, for dental care than for anything else. If you look at the numbers, and there's a, there is an income gradient for sure, uh, but what's interesting is in the case of cancer, you can go to a public hospital, you can go to an outpatient department. The waiting times are, are way too long, but they're in the weeks, 60 days maybe, uh, whereas with dental care in this state, it's over a year.
So you know, we've, we're we're they're quite different in their uh, in their access consequences. Now these matrices, of course, always sort of look like maps of Australia, and it's always kind of really bad to be in Albany, and it's really good to be in Cairns. So, Marion, what's the transport in Cairns? So the the Commonwealth um, has an interesting role in transport and in cities for that matter because um, it doesn't own the transport network and it doesn't run the transport network and it doesn't really have jurisdiction in cities. And yet the Commonwealth has got deep pockets and and the so, so the way that this works is that it um, contributes funding to the states and it's got quite involved in cities of late. So we've seen city deals have been a big thing of the current government and the Labor opposition is also very keen on city deals and beefing them up. And also regional deals. So it's a, a different kind of structure, but essentially um, I think what's going on here is that uh, the politicians are responding to what we're seeing with um, very rapid population growth in some places, so in southeast Queensland, here in Melbourne, and in some of the, um, the big cities and also some but not all of the medium-sized cities. Um, and at the same time, uh, so, so and the congestion and crowding and those kind of concerns that people have. But at, on the other side of it, some regional areas are crying out for population and this kind of thing. So it's trying to solve two quite distinct problems in one fell swoop. And I think what it's going to mean in terms of priorities is that we will get um, the Commonwealth continuing to pick and choose what projects it, it wants to support and what states it wants to support them in and that kind of thing. But um, in, in terms of transport, it, it, it is quite um, constrained by what the states are willing to do. And at the extreme, we do see the Commonwealth withholding money, like with East West Link and with Perth Freight Link, waiting for a state government willing to proceed with the projects. But by and large, the projects are generated by the states. And so the Commonwealth gets to choose from projects that have been essentially nominated by and large by the states. Uh, I, I guess that raises the obvious question. Are, are these regional deals or city deals, are they anything more than just dressing up old-fashioned pork barreling, barreling under a sort of fancy name? They're a mixed bag, I think, John. Um, so some of the ones that have been... So some of them have a lot more development work behind them than others, and I think in that category um, I would put the Western Sydney city deal and the, um, what looks like the imminent South East Queensland city deal. But I think this all kicked off with the Townsville Stadium. And that one, I don't know that there was a lot behind that one. Right. Uh, Tony, where are we, are we on energy? I'm guessing that climate change is somewhere in Cairns. Well, I have a, um, John, I've got a cartoon on my desk and it's got a, there's a, a couple, old couple, watching television and they're sitting back and, um, the, 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 the lady says to her, presumably her husband, um, is um, the news is saying that um, Australia's economy is, go economy is going very well, but the planet's environment is going very badly. And he turned to her and said, well, aren't we glad we live in Australia and not on the planet? <laughs> <laughs> and it seems to me we've been playing that game along that line for quite some while, because at the core of... Some of the challenges I mentioned before in relation to electricity prices and reliability at the core of them is a failure of climate change policy because we haven't had clear signals from governments as to what sort of investment we need. Therefore, investors have not been investing the sort of stuff we need to maintain reliability and drive down prices. And so as a consequence of that, climate change has to come first, I think. And one of the challenges here, of course, is this is, this is a Commonwealth obligation and it's in the absence of that that we have seen state governments intervening on climate change policy not in ways that make a lot of sense but you can understand why they do it and we've seen some of you may have read about this in the news where courts and regulators are also taking a role in this because they're not happy with the way the Commonwealth's doing this so I think and, and business has changed as well John so I think on this issue we have to start to put in place the beginnings of and emissions reduction policy. And um, when we start this journey, we'll actually find we can go a lot faster, it'll be a lot cheaper, and it'll be a lot, and we'll end up with cleaner air, cleaner energy than we ever thought. But starting it is the really hard thing to do. And the rest of these things that we then have in importance, which is getting our reliability right, 
getting our cost down will largely flow from getting the first one right because the other ones also involve a harder task, and you mentioned before some of the harder things, is then working with the states and territories because we have this thing in Australia called cooperative federalism. Unfortunately, sometimes it looks more like um, uncooperative federalism. Thank you. So, of course, Tony runs the small program at Grattan, which is energy, and I'm responsible for the large program, which is retirement incomes. Now, dirty secret. As Australians, we spend more money having our superannuation managed and administered than we spend as households on energy. It's a sobering thought that for all of the yelling and screaming about higher electricity prices, uh, in fact, we're spending more money having our super managed. Uh, and so I would suggest that one of the things that's sort of more up on the Northwest Cape even, uh, than many of the other things we've been talking about is how much we spend having our superannuation managed. Uh, and indeed, it's one of the things that comes through the chart, I, uh, the, the, the scorecard. I talked about the way that um, we don't, we have pretty good outcomes in terms of retirement incomes relative to pre-retirement incomes for <coughs> people in the sort of bottom third and we don't spend very much government money. But as individual households, we spend way more money um, having our savings administered and managed as a percentage of those savings than in, in essentially all of the other comparator countries. Uh, and so that's why we think things like the uh, Productivity Commission's uh, suggestions for a best in show for default funds is a really good idea uh, because it will put real pressure on costs which are manifestly too high and it just so happens, indeed probably not coincidental, but the funds that have the lowest fees or lower fees typically actually have better performance than the ones that have high fees. That's before you've paid the fees. And therefore, of course, they have much better performance after you've paid the fees. Uh, this is one where the, both parties are not planning to do the right thing. Uh, I suspect both of them are talking about cutting the tail. And this is an argument that I think we've made explicitly in the Orange Book for the first time. We don't think that will work. Uh, and the reason that it won't work is that if you have a process that says we're going to rub out superannuation firms that are not doing a particularly good job, the way that that works as a matter of legal reality is that as soon as the regulator goes after a firm, uh, then the firm will basically lawyer up, uh, it will argue that the government has taken into account irrelevant considerations and it hasn't provided natural justice uh, and that it has used the wrong coloured pieces of paper and five years later and $20 million later um, from both the firm and the regulator, you will get nowhere. And the reality is there are a lot of super funds that are underperforming and you are in fact never going to take on anything like all of them. Whereas if you have a system around best and show where you say we're going to pick 10 of the best ones, even if you pick one and the number 11 says, look, we, we really should have been number 10, if they lawyer up and go to the courts and say, oh, look, we were really number 10, the way that the courts think about tender processes is they say, we are just not getting involved. Unless you can show us that someone who was involved in selecting the tenders took money from somebody involved in the tender, we're just not interested. Uh, and so uh, it turns out that if you try to cut the tail by sort of sitting there with a a hatchet and you try and cut the tail, effectively all you'll do is take off a few whiskers. Whereas if you say we're only going to take the top ten, sort of we're going to focus on the head, then you will get the tail. <laughs> uh, and of course one of the things that's maybe different about superannuation opposed to dogs is, is um, you don't need the rest of the dog um, if it's superannuation. You just need, you know, if you've got 15 or 20 pretty good ones at the top, that's actually all that you need. And yes, that's probably going to seem pretty harsh on the superannuation funds that are maybe in the middle, but, you know, dirty secret, this system is not supposed to be run for their benefit. It's supposed to be run for our benefit. Uh, that is actually the purpose of the system, and so we should set it up uh, accordingly. The other thing that's a big deal, uh, uh, particularly in an election which um, is supposedly one of the major issues is about low wage growth, is if we move the super guarantee from 95 to 12%, that means that wages will be about 2% lower than they would be otherwise. Uh, and when you have very sluggish wage growth as we do, that is a big deal. Uh, and uh, as you all may be aware from the work that we published in Money and Retirement, um, Australians are already in the position that the vast majority of Australians have uh, income in retirement that is sufficient to provide a lifestyle that's essentially comparable to the lifestyle they had before they were retired. 
Uh, and if we are already in that world, and if we are already in a world in which retirees are by and large more comfortable with their financial situation than everybody else, it's very unclear why we would want to inflict effectively a wage cut on people who are working today. So that's, a, I think, a very big issue. And the only one I'd like to finish on um, is uh, in terms of integrity reforms. Um, so uh, we could be doing a lot better. We should have um, uh, limits on the amount you're allowed to spend on a political campaign. We should require that you're, you must disclose donations, not the current threshold, which is 13,000, which is very, very high, but something much lower than that. And we should also require that donations be aggregated up so that if you donate, call it $1,000 twice, then we count that. Uh, and we should also require that you still count it as a donation, you have, still have to disclose it if all you have done at the, is um, pay for the privilege of sitting next to a minister, which, believe it or not, at the moment, precisely because it is not, qualif uh, not counted as a donation, doesn't get separately disclosed, which does seem a little ridiculous. Um, so we could be doing better on all of those things. We could definitely be better on regulating lobbyists, so our <coughs> very simple... Um, uh, it's not a solution in this area, but something that would at least push in the right direction is to say anyone who has an orange pass, which allows you effectively backstage at Parliament, and I fall into that category as do a number of other people at Grattan, should be forced to, require as lobby, uh, to register as lobbyists and should be required to abide by the lobbyists' code of conduct. And although Danny won't let me shut people in prison up uh, if they um, breach that code, um, I'm sure, as I said, we can find other punishments. I, for one, would make them... Uh, I'd sit them in a room and make them read through every single one of the rent seeker submissions uh, to a superannuation inquiry. Uh, and I think that would be a suitable punishment. Um, but I'm sure we can find other ways of enforcing it as well. Um, not least, cancelling their backstage passes to Parliament House, which do in fact make the business of lobbying a great deal easier. So those are some of the things that I guess we see coming out of the Commonwealth Orange Book that we should, we and could do better. Uh, but it's probably time that we hand it over to you as the audience to ask your questions of those of us here um, about what you think are, should be, uh, or could be the issues for the Commonwealth election. Uh, so we might go to the lady at the back first and then we'll come to this gentleman in the white just in front. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, question for Stephen regarding uh, the one of the recommendations in the orange book, orange book around um, sugar sweetened beverage taxes. So great to see that in there. Two parts to the question. Can you confirm that you're advocating for that tax to be directed or borne by consumers? And if that's the case, why are you advocating that that tax be, or that increase in price, be borne by consumers rather than taxing the producers instead? So, we actually have just said there should, well, uh, there should be just a, a tax on the sales, essentially, of the, of the product. Um, whether, what will happen is that the uh, consumers will also change their consumption patterns. And so the incidence of the tax won't directly fall on consumers anyway. It'd be an increase in price. Um, whether whether you tax it, where, whether you tax it at the wholesale producer end or the retail um, sales end, it doesn't particularly matter. Um, we haven't actually spent. We've 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 in our sugar sweetened beverages report, we proposed a particular design. Um, but we're actually not completely wedded to that design. We just said it for uh, illustrative purposes so we could cost it, so we could estimate the impacts. So I, you know, if you press me, I, I wouldn't say that the design we had in that report was necessarily the perfect design, but what we are saying in that report is we think we should be, be introducing a tax on sugar-sweetened beverages that if we did it the way we suggested, it would raise about half a billion dollars. It would recoup the costs that sugar-sweetened beverages put on the taxpayer. Marion, you've spent some time working in Treasury thinking about taxes and incidents. Um, Marion worked on, amongst other things, the Henry Tax Review. Um, does it matter whether we formally say this is a tax that's paid as a consumption tax or whether it's a tax levied on producers? So, um, it, 
it can matter in an efficiency sense, but I think, um, as, as Stephen's saying, if um, who pays the tax in a legal sense is not necessarily the same um, party who pays it, um, who bears the, the brunt of it in effect. And, and we see that play out in a lot of things. So it's, um, I would have thought in a case like this that it probably would be shared, the incidents would be shared between the consumer and the producer, probably. Thank you. Um, we might go to the gentleman there. Thank you. I'm interested in the opinion of the panel on which of the two major parties is more likely to be uh, able to manage economic growth more successfully over the, over the next four years. Well, that's a big question. Um, and I suspect we probably have to chop that up into bits. So, so Tony, um, I guess we, we, we're not in the business of kind of marking the parties out of ten, but, but how would you characterise the differences between the parties, for example, on emissions policy? Well, at the moment, um, I guess one of the key differences is one party has one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's difficult to do, make much more comment than that. Um, it's, it's not... There are things that the Commonwealth, the, the Coalition has been doing, and um, arguably there's some things that, are, that were introduced by the Howard government that have been contributed to lower emissions in the electricity sector. But when you look at the, um, um, the, the, the actual policies, there's, there's, we are not on track to meet our international commitments. They'll have to be higher anyway, and so that needs to change. And I think if you look at the Labor Party current platform, which has a lot of still to be um, exposed details around it, um, it looks like it might have the beginnings of a policy. Remember, the platform that Labor is taking to the selection is a Liberal Party <laughs> policy, which they couldn't support themselves, and what they've done is put a Labor badge on the bonnet and propose to drive it the damn sight faster. Marion. So, um, when I think about your question from the perspective of transport and cities, I'd say that um, in terms of transport, it's been quite, um, there's been an incremental change over the past 10 years as the institutions of the Infrastructure Australia, Inf Infrastructure Victoria and the other I-bodies have been established and bedded down. And I don't see a lot of difference between the parties on that front, even though a lot of money is spent. But one area that I think is perhaps worth watching from the point of view of economic growth is the management of cities and, and their stance towards cities. And what's happening here, I th um, or what concerns me with calls to um, try to move population out of cities or sprinkle population more evenly over Australia, is that we... Um, so you, a party may well want to have a, a particular policy to do with its agricultural workforce, and I, I sort of I perfectly accept that you might want to do that, but it's quite a different thing. It's got nothing really to do with congestion. Congestion is aggravating, it is annoying, and people don't like it, particularly if the change is rapid. But it is the flip side of the, of the benefits of density and the benefits that we get from being in cities, which is what draws us all to them. So I think uh, in terms of... We, <coughs> over recent um, years, productivity growth has been slower than... Um, history might have led us to expect, and the reasons for that are much debated and perhaps not that well understood. But one thing we do know is that cities um, are generators of productivity, um, that more GD GDP per capita is generated in cities and in other areas. So I, I suppose I think it's very important not to kill the goose that lays the golden egg here. Um, I think a couple of, of observations I would make. Um, the first is that I think we should be modest about how much government can change things. So the reality is, year to year, most economic growth is essentially beyond the control of governments, and the big things that will make it go up or down are beyond the control of governments. The big things that will make the Australian economy go up or down, for example, are essentially about demand from iron ore from China. You know, if, if essentially a large chunk of South American uh, iron ore production and coal production goes offline, that's, you know, very bad news for South America, but very good news for Australia. Uh, on the flip side is if the Brazilians and the Venezuelans and the Chileans get a lot of their issues sorted out in terms of tailings dams, you know, that will effectively... And if the Chinese economy doesn't grow so quickly, that's probably, in a funny way, very bad news for Australia. And, and of course, both those things are completely beyond the control of any Australian government. 
So I think we need to be modest, and it's also true that the kinds of interventions that a government makes in an economy, um, with the exception of doing the truly stupid, by and large don't change things that much. Um, but that said, you know, there are things that they can do that will have an impact over time. So for example, if we really drive the costs down in superannuation, that can make a material difference. If we're spending $30 billion a year having our superannuation administered and, and managed, and if we can push, call it $10 billion of that out of the system, that's about, you know, half a percent of a point of, of economic growth. You only get it once, but, you know, that's actually quite a lot in the scheme of things. And there are countries who have their, you know, um, savings managed for that kind of price. So it's doable. You're not going to get there in one year. Um, another interesting one is around the higher education system. We've had a demand-driven higher education system in which essentially the Commonwealth paid for every student uh, that a university was prepared to take, uh, in combination of essentially a grant to the university and a loan to the student. Uh, the consequence of the obvious consequence of that was that the number of students went up, and of course the Commonwealth paid a lot more as a result. Uh, the secondary impact of that was that we saw a number of uh, areas where we had shortages of skilled people uh, with appropriate qualifications. The number of those areas with shortages has substantially dropped. So you'd expect that that's probably meant the economy is running a bit better than it would be otherwise. And then the third thing, which is a little bit more subtle and, and harder to measure, is it essentially meant that the universities had to compete much harder with each other. Uh, because all of a sudden uh, there were universities that were not getting as many students as they did last year uh, because other universities had expanded their course offerings and it meant that universities became, uh, which um, in the absence of external pressure tend to sort of, well, if we took, you know, 50 students in that course this year and 150 that in this course last year and 200 over here, well, we'll do the same next year. As soon as you had a demand-driven system, if this course was losing students, you just shut it down. Uh, and I think that that's probably, um, in the long run, driven some significant um, rethinking in universities. And going back to effectively a capped system, which is what the coalition has done in the last year, um, in the long term will lead to less efficiency in the universities uh, and also um, uh, poorer match between the courses that students do. Uh, and what employers demand. Because no matter how wise and brilliant Canberra bureaucrats are in terms of working out where the places should be allocated, my guess is that students make better decisions than they do. Uh, because, of course, students have rather more at stake. And then the third place that you know, clearly is at issue in this uh, election is around tax. We've had a lot of discussion about the way that tax cuts will lead to economic growth. And that's true in a kind of trivial sense, that if you, if you reduce taxes all other things being equal, then economic growth will be higher. But of course, by definition, all other things being equal, debt will also be higher. And at some stage, either spending will have to be lower or taxes will have to be higher in the future. So you can always bring economic growth forwards by cutting taxes, but that doesn't actually make us wealthier in the long run. Uh, you only, tax change only makes you wealthier in the long run if it drives changes in behaviour to either make people more efficient or to increase um, participation. Uh, and that's, I think, something that's been slightly lost in the tax debate that we're having. And I think what's particularly been lost is that we do know something about this. Uh, we do know that if you give tax cuts to people who are already earning, earning $200,000 a year, it doesn't change their behaviour very much. By and large, they are men working full time. You know, most people over, earning over $200,000 are in that category. Uh, and for a man working full time, if He's going to pay a little bit less tax um, if, uh, than otherwise if he you know, manages to take any other job and get you know, paid $220,000 a year. It's not really going to change his decision about whether he takes that job. Uh, and so you give tax cuts to people at the top and you don't change their behaviour very much. And, and in particular, they're what we call effective marginal tax rates. So how much do they, ta how much do they give back for every dollar that they get paid? is around about 47, 48, 49 cents, which you know, no doubt seems like a lot to people who are on 200,000. But the people in Australia who really have high effective tax rates are people who are second income earners with children in childcare who would be earning, say, $80,000, which is a, um, uh, more or less a median, median full-time wage in Australia. Uh, and they are overwhelmingly women. 
Uh, and for them, if they're working three days a week at the moment and they've got kids in childcare, their employer comes to them and says, well, I'd like you to work an extra day, their response will be typically, I could work an extra day, but the government will take 95 cents or more of every dollar you pay me. And I'm going to have to pay for additional transport, and I'm probably going to have to pay for additional help around the house, and so on. And that doesn't look wildly attractive to me. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think one of the things that's got lost in the debate is the people in Australia who really face very high effective marginal tax rates are second income earners in those middle income brackets, and a lot of the tax cuts that are being talked about are frankly not going to help them very much. Now, if you really wanted to solve that problem, you would actually have to do a lot of work thinking through exactly how we have designed our tax system, uh, the withdrawal of welfare benefits, particularly around family tax benefit, uh, the costs of childcare and childcare support, particularly the way that the more you earn, the less childcare support you get. Now, that is a genuinely difficult problem. As someone who's had a little bit of a go at it, I can tell you I don't know the answer and it's really hard. Uh, but governments have got no chance of solving that problem, and many countries have much lower effective marginal tax rates for people in that situation than we do. And so one of the things that the Orange Book recommends as perhaps one of the first places to go uh, if you are a newly elected government is set up a review to try and work out that question before you work out your really big tax cuts and then do your tax cuts having thought that through and design them around substantially improving that situation because then you really will get an economic kicker. The evidence that that will lead to more women working more hours uh, is very, very substantial. Um, and so it really will have an economic impact. Uh, we'll go there and then we'll go to the gentleman in the centre. Oh, uh, sorry, there's a <coughs> gentleman here. Thank you. I have a question for Stephen. Um, so looking at the performance of our healthcare system, uh, from equity lens, there's areas like mental health and Aboriginal health that's not performing as well. So what do you think, how do you think the government should prioritise those areas in terms of the focus? And if you were to give advice to the government to how to tackle those issues, what would your advice be? Um, thank you for probably the worst question of the, uh, of the evening. <laughs> um, so as it happens, we're just looking at Indigenous health today um, looking at differences in survival rate, cancer survival rates for Indigenous and not Indigenous Australians, and there's a significant difference uh, between the two. And this is, you know, for a when setting aside the whole issues of uh, housing and clean water and all those other things, and just looking at cancer treatment. Look, cancer survival is different between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. So. There are, the, the way you deal with this is going to be multifactorial, obviously. What you need to do at the primary care level, what you need to do at the specialist level are, are quite different at primary care. I support, we, have, we haven't, I should start by saying we haven't done any work at Grattan on all of this, so this is just not necessarily based on Grattan reports, but obviously investing in uh, strengthening the Aboriginal controlled community health organisations to actually get the primary care system right and also making sure that the hospital system is culturally appropriate to, to try and get the specialist system right. Similarly with mental health, um, the good news is there's a Royal Commission into mental health in this state. Um, as you may know, we did a report on quality of safety of hospital care in Victoria a few years ago now, and the only area where we addressed access issues was in mental health, that the the access problems in mental health were very great and we had some quite strong words to say about the need to address the mental health, uh, the problems of access to mental health care. I think the problems are associated with stripping out support in community mental health and, uh, and then creating over uh, excess demand on the hospital system. But I don't want to preempt what the Royal Commission would say, but it's something along those lines I think will come out of it. Uh, one of the questions that came in in advance was a question about what should we do about social housing. So one of the material differences between the parties, well, sorry, it's, it's an obvious difference, query whether it's material as the ALP is promising to put 
a sum of money, although in fact over the first four years it's, it's actually quite a small sum of money, it's I think only about 200 million, um, towards uh, building more social housing. Uh, in particular, uh, promising a scheme a little bit like, although it's unclear how like, uh, the National Affordability, sorry, National Rental Affordability Scheme, NRAS, uh, that existed under the um, Rudd-Gillard governments. Uh, so um, the, the short answer to that question is uh, we don't think it'll make all that much difference. Uh, and the thing that will really make a difference to the affordability of housing, both for people on middle incomes and for people on low incomes, is essentially what's the balance between the number of people looking for housing in Australia and the number of houses uh, and, and apartments that we've built. Uh, and as far as we can make out, the dominant issue is that um, uh, combination of state government legislation and the way that councils administer that planning legislation has, particularly in Melbourne and Sydney, uh, to a significant extent slowed down the rate of housing construction relative to population growth and that's essentially meant that the price has gone up because that's usually what happens when demand doesn't meet supply. Uh, and so if we are serious about this problem, you don't try and kind of throw a bit of money uh, at the social housing sector and hope that that fixes what's actually a really large problem. Uh, you are going to need to um, deal with planning systems. Now, of course, that's something that's primarily an issue for state governments, but it is something that perhaps through city deals, the Commonwealth could be providing financial incentives, which is of course a polite word for bribes, uh, to state governments and to local councils to say, well, if you do indeed make it easier for more dwellings to get built, we will give you some money to improve the local library, of course, uh, to um, uh, improve the local park, to pay for upkeep on the local park, whatever it might be that will really help that local community. Uh, so that's going to make a big difference. We do need more social housing for people who are homeless or pretty close to it. Uh, and we've seen very little growth in that, and that's a problem when we've had very substantial population growth. Um, uh, but we su would suggest that if we are going to solve that, then the next scheme will have to be very different from the National Rental Affordability Scheme. We talk about this in the Orange Book. Um, uh, in particular, we shouldn't be giving anything like as large a develop, uh, an incentive to developers, but we also need to target that housing much more tightly right at the people who need it, rather than what happened under NRAS, which is frankly quite a lot of middle income earners wound up just getting cheap housing because they won the lottery. Uh, and that doesn't seem a particularly good use of public money. Uh, so now, I think we had a question over here. Thank you. Uh, a question from, from Marion. Uh, You've, you've touched on the federal state issue. Um, wh which of the parties are best able to deal with, uh, effectively deal, deal with federal state financial relationships? And which of them, which of them might be able to tackle the issue of uh, duplication of effort? And in fact, what is the economic cost of duplication of effort by federal and state governments in so many sectors, including transport? Yes, so the question of which um, party is best equipped to work with the states is an interesting one. Um, sometimes it does happen that if there is the same colour of government at state and federal level that that works better, but it often seems not to work especially <coughs> well, um, although a difference can, can be stark. So I, it's not completely obvious, I think, which way that will play out. Um, the, and it will depend, I think, a lot on um, how what sort of structures they set up and, and um, in particular I think this question of city deals is going to be, it could be quite important because it could be a different mechanism for um, the Commonwealth being a bit more interventionist in transport and other matters. Um, so it's, it's, they're being used for things like um, the framework for giving funding for major new rail and freeway infrastructure and so, so I, I do think that they're going to be important. But I think structurally, both uh, both parties are um, at least sort of give, pay lip service to the idea that they're committed to these institutions of independent infrastructure advisory bodies. And um, I, I think it's unlikely that there'll be any substantial difference between um, if there were to be. Um, a Labor government returned to what we have seen under the coalition at present, or if a coalition is returned, that they would have any substantial change in their existing practice. Uh, so on that slightly depressing note, 
Uh, this, on the other hand, is the orange book for the next Commonwealth Government, and it's, as I said at the beginning, it's designed to encourage them to do better um, uh, once they have got elected, whoever that might be. Um, given the time, I'm afraid we're going to have to bring things to a close. Um, firstly, can I thank uh, my fellow panellists, uh, Tony, Marion and Stephen. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank again the State Library, our very generous hosts for this evening, uh, and uh, the important role that libraries play both tonight and much more generally. I was delighted to see how many people here do use public libraries. I'd like to thank, uh, just take a little moment to thank Grattan staff. Um, I think there's 183 pages in the Orange Book. It's an attempt to summarise 10 years worth of Grattan work. Uh, as we say somewhat unusually in the introduction, every single member of Grattan staff over 10 years has effectively contributed to the material in the, Grattan, in, in the Orange Book. Um, and you know, I want to thank them. It's an enormous body of work. Um, I would like to think that it's already made a difference, much of it, uh, but uh, hopefully it will make even more of a difference uh, in future. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, this is uh, Grattan's 10th anniversary, and if you want to read more about the impact we've had, we've put up on the web uh, a report about the impact that we've had, as well as a, a speech I gave at the 10th anniversary <coughs> dinner talking about how that has happened. Uh, what is it that happens behind the scenes uh, that perhaps gives you an idea about the enormous work uh, from Grattan staff that's gone into producing not only this report, but all of the things that lie behind it. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the various um, uh, philanthropists and individuals and, and companies that over the years uh, have contributed to Grattan and continue to do so. Um, we are only an important and independent institution because we have that support. Um, speaking truth to power is by and large a somewhat uncomfortable position. Uh, and if you are worried about who is paying the next paycheck, it's even harder. Uh, and so the support that's been provided to us has made a really big difference. And then finally, thank you to all of you, our audience. Um, uh, you are the people who actually have to make a decision in the next election. As I hope tonight has illustrated, this is an election in which there are a lot of <coughs> really big issues at stake. There are some very substantial differences between the parties, more perhaps than in most elections, uh, and on issues that really matter. And then once the election is over, there will be even more issues for whoever is the new government to think about. So um, uh, don't vote twice. You don't need to vote early, but you do need to vote wisely. Uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you at the next Grattan event after you've done so. Thank you very much.